If you haven't already, we're inviting everybody to check in by sharing um, the, the name of the territory where they are right now um, and the indigenous peoples of that territory, if you know them. Uh, so you can put that in the chat now. And we're just gonna take a moment to, um, to begin with an acknowledgement of, of territory. I guess I should start by introducing myself as well. Uh, my name is Peter. Um, I'm on uh, traditional territory of the Mississaugas, who are an Anishinaabe people, and the Haudenosaunee and the Wyandotte peoples. And I've been here in this part of Turtle Island for about 10 years now, originally coming from uh, the United Kingdom. And I came here with the intention of uh, seeking to be in solidarity with indigenous communities. And it's been really interesting to me to, to see over the last 10 years how so many different uh, places have adopted land acknowledgements as part of their centering and gathering. Um, and it's been interesting to hear people's opinions on these. Um, I had a student who uh, wrote a report about the use of land acknowledgements in the Toronto District School Board. Um, and comparing the land acknowledgement and the national anthem at the beginning. And uh, the report was titled uh, Robotic Meaningless Apologies. Um, so you can see that it's, it's quite a contested thing. It's something that um, can be really meaningful in some situations. And in other situations, people say, well, what does it mean? What does it mean to do a land acknowledgement um, without having concrete action? So as we are acknowledging our land and as uh, I invite you all to acknowledge the land um, in the chat function or in your own thoughts. Just invite us to think about how is this acknowledgement stepping beyond that? Um, how are we, um, by knowing, what are we able to do? And I think I'm really excited um, about our speakers today who are going to help us think through some of that. Um, and here are some of the, the ways it's possible to do something. Um, with that knowledge, um, to be truthful and engaged with that knowledge, um, as well as the things that don't always work out so well. I hope that we'll hear a couple of stories of things that, of some, some good failures as well that we can learn from. As many of you know, this is, uh, I think this is the fourth part of a seven part series. It's uh, more or less one, one a month. Um, convened by Mount Church Eastern Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Working Group. And what we really wanted to do was do storytelling. Um, so we've heard from, uh, we've had several, several sessions where we've heard from Indigenous people uh, inviting us into the, the deeper story of the land and the story of resistance and, and survival. Um, and uh, this, is, this is an opportunity for us to hear from some settler allies from some people who have been making allyship with indigenous communities part of their, their life and their work. So I think that's a really important thing for us, us to do. And I, uh, if, you're, if you're not already registered for the subsequent uh, sessions of this series, I'd encourage you to do that. So I wanna give thanks to Mennonite Church Eastern Canada and particularly Lisa Williams, uh, who's acting as our, our tech host um, Lisa's available to answer any tech questions or issues that come up and um, she's going to put her phone number in the chat uh, so that you can you can contact her or you can send her a message using the chat function. Um, so thank you so much for doing that. It means so much that we can uh, we can show up and be hosted in this generous way. And of course I want to introduce Mim as well, uh, who many of you will know. Mim is uh, generously serving us um, as a, oh, hey, hey, there you are, <laughs> as a um, spiritual companion and someone who's available to communicate with, especially if things are difficult. Mim, would you like to say anything about the role that you'll be playing? I am just here to either chat with you through the chat function or um, I believe Lisa will put a number up. You can give me a call. It should come through to my cell phone. Um, the MCC offices are closed, but I have been told that it should still bounce to my phone. So 
hopefully that will work fine. That's great. Thanks so much. And I think we're ready to open and uh, you good to open with, with a prayer. So tonight I feel very strongly that um, I want to smudge everyone that is on this call. And I know for some people that may be a little uncomfortable, but for me, smudging is a prayer. It's a way of visually clearing your head, clearing what you're carrying behind you, cleaning what you're carrying in front of you, cleaning your eyes so you can see good things. You're going to clean your ears so you hear tonight what is going to happen. And clean your mouth so you speak good things. And we always take the smoke to the heart because that is where love, creator, and all good things abide. So I'm just going to gently smudge the screen. And tonight, I really want to focus on kindness. I'm not sure why, but that has come very strongly to mind in the last couple days um, with everything that is going on in our world. Um, there's one thing that we can always do, and that is be kind. It doesn't cost us anything. Being kind doesn't necessarily mean um, being gentle, um, or sometimes it can mean saying truths that are a little bit difficult, but you can say them with kindness in your heart. So I'm going to ask you either pull up a chair beside you or visually pull up a chair and pretend the creator is sitting beside you tonight and that he is with you on this call and in this meeting and that that kindness is also sitting there with creator in that chair. I want you to remember kindness in your words, kindness in your listening because Sometimes what you hear may not be what was intended or maybe was not quite what was said, but it's the way that it hits your ears. I want you to remember kindness if you respond and in the comments. And I want you to remember kindness to all those who are around you, not just tonight, but in the days to come. Walk in kindness. Walk with hope and walk well and honor all the relations that are around you, which include the winds and the birds and the trees and the animals, not just the two-legged people that you walk with on this journey, because those two are our relations and are our relatives and they need to be honored. They're struggling just as much as we are right now, but they also have a trust and in some ways a happiness, sitting there watching a squirrel today out the window. Um, he was looking for food, but he didn't seem to be super concerned about the whole thing. He was also chasing his buddy and um, having some fun in the wind. Um, so it was a really nice little lesson. Um, just sitting right there outside my window as I was um, on another Zoom call this morning. So I'm just, I'm going to leave it there. I don't normally do like really formal prayers, um, but I, I want to get, leave you those things to think about and walk with you as we walk through this session tonight. Uh, thank you so much on my relations. Thanks so much for beginning us with that call to kindness. Um, let's, let's keep coming back to that as we, as we go. It's, if there's anything else we do in our work, we should we should be doing that. Well, I'm going to stop talking soon. I'm going to hand it over to Rick and Steve. And if you registered for this event, you will have had a chance to read their bios. So I'm not I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is uh, just say that both of these men are part of my spiritual community. Um, Rick is serving with Mennonite Central Committee. Steve is working with Mount Church Canada, and both of them are people who have um, helped me to understand as I've come as a visitor to these lands, um, what my responsibility is 
as a settler person and as someone who's trying to be a follower of Jesus um, and even a follower of Jesus specifically in the Mennonite tradition. So I'm grateful to both of them and I'm for, for the, the witness that they're, they're offering with their lives and the wisdom that they're gonna share with us. Um, I think we, we decided that Rick was, was gonna speak first. Um, so without further ado, I turn it over to you. And I, oh, you know what? Here's some further ado. Uh, friends, if you have questions uh, as, as we're going, I invite you to share them directly in the chat. And uh, Scott is here with us and he'll be reading through the chat and compiling these questions so that our speakers don't have to um, don't have to kind of uh, follow that themselves. Uh, so if, if something comes to mind and you think, oh, I really want to pick up on that again later, just put it in the chat and then you can forget about it. And Scott will pick it up and we'll bring it back to our attention later. All right. Now, over to you, Rick. Thanks so much. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for your warm welcome. And, and Mim, for your call to kindness to us tonight. That's an excellent tone for us. And to the, uh, according to my count, uh, 145 of you who have chosen to spend your evening, um, unless you're in a very different time zone, uh, your evening with us here uh, this Wednesday. Um, I see some close friends and some people in my neighborhood and in my church, and uh, that's very gratifying. Thank you for, for joining in. I was teasing my colleagues as we were setting up that, uh, you know, I'm the old guy here, and maybe that's why they're letting me go first. Um, but I also have a, a pretty old story that I want to tell, and it's not old even by, you know, by my age or the age of, of some of those call, people on this call who are older than I. It's, a, it's an oral history story that uh, I've heard um, from one person several times and then another person in the same community, and that was significant. And so as I, as I sort of set up this story, you'll see that it's, it's more timeless than old, I hope. So the story was told to me um, by Lehman Gibson, uh, the late Lehman Gibson. He, um, he's been gone for a few years now. And I got to know Lehman through my work with Mennonite Central Committee. I live here in Ontario. Uh, Louise and I are at uh, Row Route Number One, Shakespeare. And the Mennonite Central Committee Office of Ontario, where I was working at the time, is in Kitchener. And many of you on this call tonight are in the Haldeman Tract, the six miles on either side of the Grand River mouth to source. And I came to MCC Ontario's work at a time when there was a significant shift from saying that we're mostly trying to build relationships with indigenous people in the north, where none of our Mennonite community, or almost none of our Mennonite Anabaptist community lived, to saying, well, who are the neighbors that are right next door? Who are the people you know, down the river? Or who do our kids play hockey with? I have some hockey stories from when I was a kid. Uh, who do we play ball against? Who are the people that we actually rub shoulders with? And for us in the Haldeman Tract, that was very much the people of Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee people. And uh, to compress this story, um, MCC for many years ran a summer gardening program where volunteers would go and live and work alongside families in indigenous communities across Canada. And for a few years, the orientation, the training time for that was here in Six Nations, Ontario perfect place to do it. Spring comes early and lots of people there knew lots about growing things, corn, beans, and squash. And so it was a wonderful place for these volunteers to learn about working in the earth and growing good food from the first people that were here. So Lehman was one of those fine, fine gardeners who welcomed us. And it was probably at least the second or maybe third year that I knew Lehman. And he said, you know, Rick, there's an old story that, and, and, and he told me it was a Mr. Henhock who had told him the story. So I don't know how far back before Mr. Henhock, uh, this story had been passed, but I felt really privileged that Lehman shared the story with me. He said, when, when your people, um, and so here, little genealogy, I'm from that, tribe that came from Pennsylvania up into what was already the Haldeman Tract promised to the um, Haudenosaunee people by the crown and 
as we landed there, in the particular case of this story, there was one Mennonite farm family that wanted to rent some land from a family at Six Nations. And as was often the case, you would pay for the land, not with cash, but in kind. And in that particular year, uh, the Mennonite farmer who was renting the land wanted to grow barley, but it was a tough year. Barley didn't do very well. The rains didn't come at the right time. He did get a crop and he harvested, bagged up the crop, put the bags on the wagon and headed to the farm owner at Six Nations. And when he arrived, he was asked, um, how was the crop this year? This was, this was a difficult year. Uh, and I'm wondering how your barley did. And the Mennonite farmer said, well, actually everything that I harvested is on the wagon. It's gonna take my whole crop to pay you for the rent, but we made an agreement and I really wanna settle, uh, settle my debts. And he started unloading the, the sacks of barley. He was stopped by the Six Nations farmer who said, well, hold it. Uh, you've got children to feed. You might have some livestock to feed. And you certainly are going to need seed for next year. I can't, I can't accept your grain. And he helped him put it back on the wagon. He said, I want, I want you to take the grain home. And we're neighbors. You're not leaving. And I'm certainly not leaving. And if you want to rent land from me again, we'll work out this debt over time. But I can't take your barley now. You need time to settle this. We'll talk again next season. So stories lose their power if you tell too much about the story. But I just, I like that story because it reframes our history a little bit. Um, if you're an Indigenous person listening tonight, um, or if you're a newcomer like me, um, we can get into some ruts about the space we occupy. And for me, uh, that, that story just bumps me a little bit out of some of the presuppositions that we, we may have had about each other and invites a different kind of, uh, of relationship that I think is, is, is quite freeing and, and life-giving. If we have time later, there's a, there could be a follow-up to that that also has to do with Haudenosaunee peoples, but um, I'm gonna leave that one for now. And I want to um, switch quite dramatically in time. That, that would have been you know, probably late 1700s, early 1800s. Uh, and now we're coming up into uh, the 1990s and we're going to the Lake Huron shoreline. Some of you will remember a park called uh, Hipperwash Provincial Park. And some of you will know of it by the, um, the infamy that it's alongside uh, a military base as well, Camp Hipperwash from the 1940s, which was land taken from the people of Stony Point, Stony and Kettle Point. And some of you will know this story well. Uh, again, I had the good fortune of working for Mennonite Central Committee Ontario in these years in the 90s. And as part of getting to know our neighbors, I was invited to um, learn that story better, learn to know some of the people who were eagerly pursuing this whole question of could the people of Stony Point get that land returned, land that had been taken to create a military base during World War II. It was among other things, a place to test explosives. And there are still uh, unexploded ordnance there, which make this a very complicated story. However, in, 19, in the mid 1990s, a group of people um, moved onto the base, occupied it, and were working very hard to press the hand of the federal government to make a decision to, to return the land to its original owners. And then uh, after Labor Day, fall of 1995, uh, a small group of that um, community moved into the park. And then many of you will know this story very, very well. There was a, a confrontation with the Ontario Provincial Police. There was uh, 
firearm, heavy firearm use from the OPP. We know that. And Dudley George lost his life. What ensued was, again, many, many pieces to this, but local people um, froze with some deep fears and uncertainties about what was going to happen. The police presence grew massively. The town of Forest was um, almost a fortress. And our community, the, the, the Mennonite community, there were a number of churches within an hour or so of Stony Point. And here I'm going to identify one of them. It's Zurich Mennonite Church. And I knew Zurich not well, but we had had exchange weekends when I was in youth group and I, I knew a little bit about the church. And here I'm going to speak quite honestly and say, Zurich was not a church from what I knew as a young kid growing up in the Mennonite community that I thought was going to step up on a justice issue like what was happening at Stony Point. So if there are folks from Zurich tonight, you know, you can call me up later and, uh, and, and straighten me out. But that's, that was my presupposition at the time. However, uh, Christian peacemaker teams approached us at MCC and said, hey, this looks like it could get very, very scary. Heavy police presence, indigenous people who have lost one of their own in a violent confrontation with the police. Police who had publicly stated that they were hoping to defuse tension and instead um, we had a, a killing. So Christian Peacemaker team said, hey, you at MCC, you know some of these people, you know this community, are there ways that we could be involved that might reduce the likelihood of there being more violence. And I was thrilled when Zurich Mennonite said, absolutely, come, do it here. We'll host it in our gym. We'll, we'll supply food for the people that want to come, for the trainers, for the trainees. And I can't remember how many dozens of people came, but this community went way beyond their comfort zone and said, we don't know everything that's gone on here historically. We know we're about peace, and we also know that we're about some kind of fair resolution for this community that's lost its land. So thankfully, there, there wasn't more, uh, at least overt violence of the kind that cost Dudley George his life. Uh, time moved on, and eventually we came to trials. Ontario Provincial Police had one particular person who was charged um, with criminal negligence calling death, causing death. He was convicted. And then the trial moved to all of these Stony Point people who were charged with trespassing and a number of other um, even more serious offenses in the courtrooms of, of Sarnia, Ontario, just south of the, of the military base and Stony Point. And one of my roles, I had decided to be not a witness in the legal sense, but to bear witness to what was happening in the courtroom. So every day during the trial, I would get in our little K car and, uh, and drive to Sarnia. And to my delight, one of the other regular visitors there was uh, a mom from Zurich who would show up in time for break with a big Tupperware full of egg salad sandwiches for all the guys from Stony Point. Now, I'm not gonna identify her though. I do remember her name. Um, I don't know exactly how much insight she had into the long and complicated history, but it was a simple act of compassion, of hospitality, and I would say solidarity. She had a good sense, I think, of how politically charged this trial was and how much of um, the the tone and 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 commitment of Canada as a as a much larger community was on the line and, and, and being examined here in this particular case. And <laughs> some of the guys from Stony Point accidentally on purpose called the Mennonites, the men in tights. So they used to, they used to tease that the men in tights were showing up again with uh, egg salad sandwiches. So I think I'm gonna leave that, that story there. Um, I, I think, 
I, I was shown to have made some wrong presuppositions uh, about one of our communities. And I think in the end, the demonstration of, of simple love and, and, and hospitality um, is a significantly hopeful story uh, 25 years ago in our past. Back to you, Peter. Thanks so much, Rick. I love that um, egg salad solidarity. And um, I don't know a lot, but I know that um, if you're trying to do solidarity work, you know that you've arrived when when they have a joke for you, right? When they when they can make fun of you, uh, there's a place for you. So, what a what a gift that is. Thanks for that. Um, let's go over to Steve. Well, good evening, friends. It's really wonderful to be with all of you, and uh, it's a it's an honor to share alongside Rick. Um, just thinking egg salad sandwiches, it's like the one sandwich that I just refuse to eat, but I get the act of solidarity. So way to go. Um, I, I um, For those of you who haven't read my bio, I'm here in Winnipeg. So I'm in Treaty One territory and this is where the Mennonite Church Canada National Office is. And my work is as the Indigenous Settler Relations Director for Mennonite Church Canada. I've been here for about 10 years. Previously, I lived out on the West Coast. Again, thanks to everyone here for uh, sharing this time of story and reflection together. Well, what I'd like to offer up tonight are two stories about how Mennonites have um, linked arms with other communities of faith in order to demonstrate solidarity with Indigenous peoples. And the communities that I'll touch on are the mainline church, which probably won't surprise anyone, uh, and the evangelical church, which might surprise a few of us. Now, what I love about these stories is that they remind us that church engagement with indigenous justice always begins with indigenous peoples and their calls to action. But they also remind us that some of the best work that we Mennonites do is when we partner with others. And I think that's because coalitions can, not always, but they can create courageous space for each other. The effect of numbers and just the synergy that that can bring. And finally, these stories remind us that the more contested zones of indigenous justice, those zones that we churches are being invited to participate in today, be it land reparations, or conflicts around resource extraction, or the call to genuinely respect indigenous spiritualities. These stories remind us that none of this stuff is new. The churches, including us Mennonites, or those of us who are Mennonites in the circle, have stories, good stories from years back that address such and can help us be faithful in the present. So with that, here's story one, Project North. In the early 1970s, oil and natural gas were discovered off the coast of Alaska. And soon the oil industry was planning a massive pipeline through the Yukon, down the Mackenzie Valley to Alberta and beyond. The pipeline was purported to be the largest engineering project in Canadian history. But the land on the pipeline's proposed route was the territory of Dene peoples, and they had not consented to this project. These indigenous peoples were deeply concerned about the potential impacts of this project, impacts on the land and their livelihoods, but also the impact on Canadians and their relationship to the land. The Dene declared that the Canadian government was violating their inherent rights by trying to push this project through without their consent. So the Dene organized and they called out for help. And many responded, including faith organizations. And together, these alliances raised awareness of the Dene's concerns. And because of the growing disquiet that they were able to create within the public, the government was forced in May 1974 to call an inquiry. They appointed 
Justice Thomas Berger to look into the social, environmental, and, and economic impacts of the pipeline. And this was, a, this was a huge win for this growing resistance movement. Well, one year later, the ecumenical community took a significant step in their support for the Dene by forming an indigenous solidarity coalition, which they called Project North. Initiated by the Anglican Church, the Conference of Catholic Bishops and the United Church, Project North aimed to do two things. It wanted to support indigenous nations in their land claim struggles. And it wanted, so that was like predominantly in the North, but it wanted to engage Southern churches in reflecting on the ethical implications of Northern development. And it wanted to get them involved in the struggle. Within a year, other churches joined in, the Lutherans, Reformed, Quakers, the Presbyterians, and Mennonites through Mennonite Central Committee. The Project North Coalition, they ended up traveling to Dene territory and they listened to the people's concerns and moved by the Dene's witness. The churches organized teachings and advocacy campaigns they published reports, they testified at the Berger Inquiry, and then they traveled east to Ottawa to petition the powers that be. And it made a real impact. In May 1977, the Berger Inquiry released its findings, and at the center of it was a recommendation that no pipeline, not only this pipeline, but no pipeline be built for at least 10 years. Two months later, in July 1977, the church I belong to and many in this circle, the Conference of Mennonites gathered for its annual assembly in Winnipeg. And we talked as church about the Dene and their resistance to the pipeline, but we also acted. Before the delegate body, a resolution on industrial development in Northern Canada was presented in support of Indigenous peoples' jurisdiction over their lands. It was a profound eight-point statement influenced by the work of that ecumenical coalition, Project North, that called on the government, get this, here's a, here's a couple of quotes, to recognize the non-ceded territories inhabited by the Native peoples from time immemorial as belonging to the residents of such territories. It asserted that land claims must be settled before any industrial projects take place. And it proclaimed that the environment has priority over energy and commercial needs. Now that sounds pretty relevant, doesn't it? Come on, give me an amen people or nod your head. All right, I think so. Now you might think that such a blatantly political statement would be vigorously opposed by many of the church delegates but the minutes of the meeting record the opposite. This is why we've got to read the church minutes. Out of the hundreds gathered, all approved with only eight opposing. And back then there were hundreds, people went to these things. The gathered people discerned that Canada's dealings with native peoples and lands was unfair. And they proclaimed another way that recognized indigenous sovereignty and the justice that created longs for. Because of the Denny's courageous fight and because of the solidarity of non-Indigenous peoples, including the church, this pipeline was never built. The extractive ways of the state were put on hold. Now for those with ears to hear, how might this story inform our action in the present? Does it speak, for example, to current indigenous struggles against the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, and the Line 3 Pipeline in this age of climate crisis? Could Mennonite and mainline churches courageously link arms once again in great fashion to support these struggles against unnecessary, harmful resource extraction. Story two, 
the Reconciliation Proclamation. On the morning of September 8, 1995, Menno Weeb, the Director of Native Concerns for Mennonite Central Committee, sat down for breakfast at the Louis Rial Hotel in Winnipeg with his friend Elijah Harper, an OG Cree from uh, Red Sucker Lake First Nation, who was also a member of um, member of Parliament for Churchill Riding. Friends for some time, the conversation between the two was intense. For two days prior, an Indigenous reoccupation of stolen reserve land in, as Rick mentioned, in Ipperwash had occurred and it had come to a deadly end with the killing of Dudley George. Harper wanted to talk to Weeb about Ipperwash, but also what was happening at the time, Gustafson Lake and the not so uh, long in the past, Oka crisis. What? How do we end all these violent and seemingly never ending conflicts that Canada has with indigenous peoples? Harper wanted to see if there was a way of addressing these political crises and repair the relationship. Elijah Harper had recently undergone um, a spiritual healing. He had a, he had a really serious physical illness and it was a spiritual healing that brought physical healing to him. And so he talked to Menno about, his vision was that in order for the political healing to happen to, uh, for Canada and First Nations, there needs to be a spiritual healing of foundations to take place. So they talked about this. And 10 days later, with the support of MCC and others, Harper announced this, the Sacred Assembly a gathering of religious and political leaders with grassroots people of all faiths that would take place in Hall, Quebec, just kitty corner to the parliament buildings in Ottawa. Well, four months later, between December 6th and 9th, more than 2,000 people came together for the assembly. They joined in ceremony and prayer treaty teachings, food and laughter, no egg salad sandwiches though, political analysis and public promises to do right. That's just a joke. Then on day four, a covenant, a covenant called the Reconciliation Proclamation was crafted and adopted by treaty elders and knowledge keepers, by members of government, by members of the Aboriginal Rights Coalition, which Mennonites were a part of, it's a predecessor to Kairos. And get this, the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. That's right, the EFC, this National Association of Evangelical Christians, a group not known for its engagement with Indigenous justice concerns. They not only embraced the Reconciliation Proclamation, but they helped write it. Well, I don't know all the history, but I think that I'm, it might have been the first time that evangelical and mainline churches actually came together to publicly say, we're going to link arms to support Indigenous justice. Now, if you haven't read the proclamation, I'll put a link in later to this. Here's a piece of it. I encourage you to check it out. It's remarkable. It asserts that Indigenous peoples as original inhabitants have a special right to the land and a responsibility to ensure its ecological integrity. It promises support for land claims. It recognizes Indigenous peoples' right to self-government. It asserts, this is fascinating, it asserts a relationship to a common creator and a respect for different spiritual paths, be they traditional indigenous, Christian, and so on. There were even Hindu and Muslim delegates gathered there. It commits churches to political advocacy around land rights, native self-government, and anti-racism. That was 25 years ago. Sounds pretty relevant, doesn't it? Well, fast forward to the near present. Two years ago, 
the EFC gathered together a bunch of church reps, including myself here in Winnipeg. Little side note, we Mennonites have been a part of the Evangelical Fellowship since 2004. We joined the Canadian Council of Churches at the very same time because that's a Mennonite thing to do. We just joined everything at, at once. We church leaders were brought together in order to respond to an invitation by this remarkable indigenous Christian community called Nates. Nates asked us evangelicals to discern our roles and responsibilities in the reconciliation journey. And then it happened. It was like a King Josiah and Lost Scroll moment. Remember that story from 2 Kings 22? For those of you in the church or whatever, you might know this story. The discovery of the lost scroll. Aileen Van Ginkel, a staff member at the EFC, shared a statement with us that they had written in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in that statement, reference was made to the 1995 Reconciliation Proclamation. But the dozen of us church reps sitting around that table, we had never heard of the proclamation. So we asked for a copy of it. And we were blown away when we saw this lost scroll. We read it line by line aloud together. Heads were shaking in disbelief around the circle. Why didn't we know this? I've been doing this work for nine years. Why doesn't everyone know this? Here was a radical indigenous justice covenant that evangelicals were a part of. At once, we could see that the power that this proclamation offered and the gift, but it also presented a challenge. Why was this covenant forgotten? Was it simply a communication issue, a failure to remember and pass it on? Or was it because the proclamation's promises were so big? Land rights, self-government, a commitment to av advocate with the powers. Did we not remember because we were not willing to go where we said we'd go? Sitting in that circle, I could, I swear I could almost hear the words of King Josiah from long ago. Great is the anger of our God, for we have not obeyed the words of his covenant or her covenant. But here's the good news. Like in that old Bible story, where King Josiah responds to the discovery of the lost covenant, not simply with tears, not simply with good words, good words and speeches from the throne, but with public policy and a budget to match. The EFC has responded to the rediscovery of the proclamation with action. We, the EFC and us church reps, created an indigenous settler relations group that wrote a paper confessing this history. You can find it online, I'll share it. We made seven new commitments that are public and radical in order to re-engage the promises of the proclamation. And we are in the process of forming, this is, I think I'm most excited about this. The EFC is creating an indigenous advisory council to guide their leadership and to inform and provide accountability for the working group that's gonna follow up on all these promises. That's pretty impressive. I don't even have that kind of structure for my work. Now there's much more that can be done, but things are moving. And as a Mennonite, I'm profoundly grateful that our church is able to serve and learn from the wider evangelical community in these efforts to decolonize and pursue justice. May it be, may we live into that. As Mennonites, we have a lot of good work to do in our own house, in our own community to be the people of peace that we long to be in indigenous lands but we also have rich opportunity to link arms with other communities on the path, be they mainline or evangelical, traditional and interfaith.
Together, I think we can be more powerful. Together, following indigenous leadership and indigenous priorities, we can do even greater things to repair the covenants that have been broken and honor the treaties. May it be. Thank you. Amen. May it be. Some amens in the chat. Some people waving their hands. So, um, thanks for those those stories. Um, you know, I heard a story about sharing seed, right, and forgiving a debt um, that upends some of it some of the power relationships that uh, we often think about when we think about what is the relationship between indigenous and settler people. And we heard a story about an act of hospitality and an act of um, simple kind of human kindness in the midst of these legal cases and clashes between, you know, militarized clashes, um, you know, what it means for some, some exile to show up at the courthouse. And then Steve took us into a story of ecumenical work that supports an indigenous-led movement to uh, to defend the land, um, to to exert um, authority over um, uh, over how the land is is to be used and how it's to be protected. And then this last story is this uh, story of with biblical um, biblical echoes, recovering a, a, a forgotten document, even one from. Uh, just 25 years ago. Whew. We're gonna um, go over to to Scott to uh, to ask some questions uh, to see kind of what the responses are in the chat, folks. You're you're in, encouraged to to continue responding and and using the chat to to share your thoughts and your questions. Um, Scott, what what's come into you? Yeah, I will kick things off here and I would love to see more uh, come in the chat. And if while I'm while I'm talking here and focused on the questions that I have, if you see another question come in, um, anybody is welcome to please flag that for me and I will. And, and, and Steve and Rick, you can also see the chat. So if you see a question you want to take on from, from the chat, go for it. Hey, um, Scott, Scott, yes. this is Rick. If, if you don't mind, just before you go, would it be all right if I put up a photograph of, of Menoweeb? Um, not to, you know, outdo my brother Steve's waving a paper one. Um, this old guy here, I actually have one uh, from our archives. Uh, some of you will know that um, um, you're probably seeing the lines in that, the click to add title. Are you saying, I'm sorry. Um, if you give me a minute, I think I can get rid of that. This is Menno in 1992. Uh, some of you might remember uh, I, Menno was somewhat a mentor to me. He was really, I think, one of the key people who helped, at least in the Mennonite community, he would have been part of Project North, as Steve said, um, but helped us begin to see there was a fundamental breach in, in the most significant social relationships in this country with uh, First Peoples who, who had welcomed us here. And I think he did more than most of his time to invite us to, to look much more deeply into that and to be committed to, to healing those relationships. So this little canister is part of the Jubilee Fund, which began in 1992. That was the so-called 500th anniversary of the discovery of the, of the Americas, of the new world. And rather than marking that in a triumphalist way, uh, Mano's dream was, and in fact, there is a scholarship for Indigenous students that was started out of that Jubilee Fund. And the other part of this story I need to tell is that Menno passed away in the last few weeks. Um, he, he leaves uh, his wife Lydia to mourn in, in Winnipeg, and we dearly hope there will be an opportunity to gather. Um, there are just as many stories as Menno told there are about him, and I think many of us here tonight um, oh, uh, both a fond and a profound debt of gratitude to Mel. So thanks for that uh, little opportunity to, to share some credit with our brother. And I'm going to take that opportunity. Thank you, Rick, for, for saying that there was, that there was a, and you saw it in the chat, people said, please 
please give a shout out to Menno Weeb for all the work that he did. And I'm going to take that opportunity to, um, before I get, I will get to the, the questions in one second, but I've got uh, a book that was edited by Steve Heinrichs and Esther Aptisen. It's called Be It Resolved. And uh, it's, it's called uh, Anabaptists and Partner Coalitions Advocate for Indigenous Justice 1966 to 2020. And if you have a look at this book, there are some there are some of the stories that were shared tonight are in here. Um, and Mena Weeb's name is on literally every second page. Um, there are some places where that is literally true. Um, he was obviously a very um, important figure. So, and I have several copies of this book that I can send to you if you want one. And Steve did not ask me to plug his book. Uh, he would never do such a thing. I did that all on my own, and that's the truth. So. Um, here are some of the questions that we've had so far. Uh, oh, I'm going to take the one that just popped up in here uh, from Scott Albrecht. What are the barriers to church bodies taking continued and more radical actions to repentance, solidarity, and justice seeking with Indigenous peoples? Um, I'm going to send that over to both of you. And I have several other questions here um, Yeah, for you. So while you're addressing that one, who, does anyone want to take that first? You know, I got to say, Scott, my audio of you cut out and I'll go to the chat to read it, but sure. why don't, uh, Steve, why don't you take the first go at it here? Yeah, just to say that's, that's a great question, reflecting on um, you know, the stumbling blocks or those, those barriers that prevent us from taking those those next steps in the relationship. I think a lot of it does boil down to um, just not knowing. Uh, Rick talked about people being in the Haldeman tract and actually not having potentially relationships with uh, their Six Nations neighbors. Or uh, I've heard stories about those um, who live next door to the Caldwell First Nation and just not knowing um, the history and uh, people and having friends and, and neighbors. So. I think that's that's probably the most obvious one is that there's a gap there, so there's a lack of um, lack of understanding, but also um, a lack of entry point. How to enter into some of those more radical next steps beyond uh, you know the book club learning that a lot of us are doing. Like uh, since you know since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I'm sure we could appeal back to even you know the Royal Commission in '96. Um, made some good waves as well. There's been a lot of um, increased knowledge base amongst churches. Um, so that's, that's been quite encouraging. But I think um, it's the lack of um, tangible relationship. And sometimes there's a, um, a lack of risk taking uh, as well that goes along with that, like the, the willingness to take a few steps and um, be okay with maybe messing up and, and, and not getting things right in those uh, attempts to connect. Um, I can remember, I'll just share personally, when I was living up north, and those of you who, uh, who joked with me in private and said, where's the altar call after I finished talking? Yes, I was a pastor at one time, so I just can't help but kind of preach when I share. So that's one of my struggles. Um, but prior to coming to Winnipeg, I was a pastor in northern BC, living right next to a, an Indigenous community. And, and I spent a lot of my um, week days on the res, just hanging out with people, with the youth, with the elders, hearing stories and all that. And it was kind of second, second nature um, to me. But I also had a job that uh, required me to do that because I was asked to go there and to work on reconciliation issues. So it was part of my mandate. So I had that um, that call pulling on me to do that. I remember my brother calling me up from the lower mainland and said, I want to come and visit you, with you. Um, and I'd love to connect on the res, even though he was living in Chilliwack, surrounded by First Nations communities. He had never been on any of the First Nations communities around with him. And he said, I just need someone to kind of hold my hand and walk with me in that process. Because he was scared. And my brother is very with it. He is... Um, quite active and engaged, but he was scared from not knowing how to do it and probably not wanting to screw up, just not wanting to cause harm. So it took hand, like someone to link arms with him and walk. And I think that's a lot of it here is 
We're not taking next steps because maybe we don't know the people in our community that we can link arms, other non-Indigenous peoples that can help us, and the Indigenous peoples in the community that are those bridge points. And uh, later on, I'll just, you know, I'll lift up Scott and Josie and others who in MCEC are, are doing that now, Herb and others in this group, with a situation around Caledonia and 1492 land back. So maybe you all, after Rick has a chance to share, want to share a little bit about that experience. How did you take a next step that was probably perceived by many as quite radical? Yeah, I, that, that, thank you so much for that answer, Steve. And I, um, yeah, I think when it, I'll, in 10 seconds, I'll say that one of the ways that I did it was having someone to link arms with, like, or somebody to say, hey, Steve, how do we do this? Or, you know, there's lots of people. I think it's so important to work together. And I'll also say, Steve, that I will be more vigilant in the chat and won't let anyone send those, bother you with comments about altar calls. I'm kidding. I actually sent him that one myself. Um, because I just, I bug him that way sometimes. I was just joking. Um, so other questions that I have are, um, let's see. Oh, Do you want to let um, Rick, can oh, Rick yes. respond to that? Uh, Steve, you were, you were thorough and eloquent. I, I, I think that's, I'll pick up the next one if that's okay. Um, okay, here's another one. Uh, how, and I, I, this question was on my mind too, but somebody said, how have these stories been forgotten or hidden? It seems like we're always starting from scratch. Yeah. And how did uh, Rick and Steve? How did you hear these stories that might have been, maybe not didn't didn't hit the news or have been, like 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 Peter was saying have been forgotten? Well, I was thinking that a lot, uh, Steve, when you talked about the sacred assembly. Um, again, I'm showing my age. I was there, and uh, you know, one of I the, I've heard this story since, but uh, I remember uh, an indigenous gentleman uh, standing up and saying, you know, um, we, um, when, when Europeans came here, uh, Christians, uh, they invited us to pray. And, uh, you know, we closed our eyes and we, when we closed our eyes, they had the Bible and we had our land. And by the time we opened them, we had the Bible and they had our land. I remember hearing that at the sacred assembly and it's stuck with me as both too true and 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 very um very much a a piece of that sacred assembly which was did you say 2000 people steve i i wouldn't have remembered the the numbers but it was a powerful gathering and you know the the book that that you've worked on steve and that uh scott showed us a moment ago is kind of this catalog of statements by only one particular group, the Anabaptist community. And there is a sense in which, um, I guess I would say we take a couple of steps forward, but we, we typically lose a bit of ground again before there's another set of nudges. There's a, a groundswell of individuals or uh, external factors that drive us forward. Some of them have been talked about tonight. Ipperwash was one, Oka was another. Um, and I think the, the TRC, thankfully, a not violent, a not loss of life kind of uh, space, but where um, you know, a broad swath of Canadians, many of us in this group tonight, I think, heard some stories. Um, lots of Canadians heard those stories for the first time. Lots of people in my generation will talk about somehow you know, feeling like I got through school and nobody told me about residential schools. How, how was that possible? Um, so I celebrate since 2015, the, the, the degree to which indigenous justice issues are in the, the more common discourse for Canadians is remarkable. Um, and I, you know, lots of examples of that, uh, I think, and, and certainly well beyond the church community. I, if history shown me anything though, we're, we're probably not gonna sustain that. It's gonna take a lot of effort. It's gonna take a lot of working groups and a lot of individuals like you gathered here tonight to sustain that and, and to not have us lose a couple notches and then have to rediscover that energy again uh, a few years from now. Um, I do think though, and this is, this is my hopeful side, that we're a little bit 
like a ratchet. You don't you don't lose all of it um, when you when you move ahead. You you hold some of that strength of deeper relationships, uh, a more committed uh, place of engagement. So I think there has been significant movement in the churches and in the Canadian populace generally, but it's going to take huge energy to sustain that and to not be distracted. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have another question that I want to get to here um, because it's related to some of the things that you were just talking about. Um, one person asked, um, how important is policing and judicial reform? And so I want to tie that back to, um, you know, Rick, your story about Ipperwash. My grandfather, who was not a Mennonite man, um, trained troops at Ipperwash uh, in World War II. And um, Harry McKelvey, my grandfather, was anything but an Indigenous rights activist. But he himself said, um, we should have given Ipperwash back to the Indians, as he would have put it, a long time ago. So, you know, why that didn't happen, I don't know. So, so my question is, what lessons did we learn from Ipperwash that we need to apply to situations now like land back 1492 and then I guess tied to that is how important is policing and judicial reform so there's kind of two questions that are closely related that I'd love to hear your thoughts on either one of you go ahead Steve no I think I think you have more experience with this than, than myself I, I'll just say you know, this is an ongoing critical conversation as we've seen just this past year with um, the Mi'kmaq fishery and, uh, you know, let's say the failure of the, of the RCMP and engagement there in, in uh, protecting Indigenous people's uh, rights in that space. Uh, think back before COVID hit last January, at this time, what was happening? Canada was... Um, all eyes focused on what Silicon territory in Northern BC, what was happening there, another RCMP raid on indigenous people's territory. So um, like when I first entered my office it, um, on, on my bookshelf there from my predecessors, Neil and Edith Von Gunn were, I don't know how many volumes, but the Ipperwash inquiry and in saying, here's the kind of reform that hap has to happen in, in state policing in relationship to indigenous peoples. And, and no doubt, I think even at the OPP level, some of those things have been implemented and such, but just, I think a lot of it just boils down to, to questions of jurisdiction, right? So the, the police are, you know, they're operating based on the state's conviction that Canada holds ultimate sovereignty, radical title to the lands. And so they hold ultimate Trump, Trump card to it. So it's, it's not a relationship between uh, equals there. Yeah. Like, and I, I think Steve, you hinted at this too, that um, certainly there are reforms needed within the police. Uh, the, the, the intended um, de-escalation at, at Stony Point, Ipperwash, and the actual outcome were just miles apart. However, um, to be fair, the police were in, in a sense trying to manage a highly politicized historic, you know, 50 years by that time since the land had been seized, more than that, to create a military base with a commitment initially that the land would be returned after the war when there was no longer need for Scott's grandpa to be there uh, training. Um, so a long, decades long unkept promise and now there are the OPP. Um, so it, it's certainly not in my view all to be laid at their feet that, that it turned out the way it did. So at times, you know, we're injecting police uh, as stopgap when a much larger um, you know, social political solution is called for. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. We see the same thing a lot of the time. Like we're we're when we don't know when we don't know what else to do, we send in the police, and then you know, terrible things ensue because the police can't do everything or be everything. You know, there's definitely yeah. Anyway, let's not get too far into that right now. Uh, there's other questions. 
Um, oh, uh, Peter had a question here. Uh, let me just find it briefly. Oh, um, what are the fears and appropriate sensitivities for Christian people who want to enter into relationship? Um, and Peter, feel free to expand on that a bit if you want to give more context for your question. I'll say a few things. Um, I, it's actually reflecting off something Steve was saying at the time, was talking about, yeah, it's good to be get a bit of hand-holding sometimes. Um, it's good to be kind of welcomed into an existing relationship for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering if, if one or both of you could speak to those of us specifically coming from a church background, um, you know, what, what's your awareness of the specific fears that we may bring with us into those relationships, um, if, that, if that makes sense? Um, and then how do, you, how do you overcome those or how have you overcome those? I guess I'm trying to get at your, your personal stories here as well. So you're asking what, what fears we may have had personally as Steve and Rick in, in, in our original entry into these relationships? Did yeah, I, I mean, right? you, can be as, you can be as honest as you like. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but you can talk about, uh, Karen, talking about your brother if you like. That's also fun. <laughs> well, my dear spouse is, is uh, on here as well. So I, I at least have to be honest. Um, well, you know, my, my hockey story was a young lad from the Saugeen Reserve who played on my team in a small town close to where I live now. And then I remember, um, you know, so he's my teammate. We're getting dressed and going on the ice together as teammates. And I remember playing against the, the lads from uh, either Six Nations or, or Kettle Point. Um, these were places I knew nothing about other than I'd meet up with them once in a while in baseball and hockey. And I, I'm, I'm sure my coach, if, if he were to hear me repeat these words now, um, I, I suspect he'd, he'd see things differently, but he made some really, really scathing, I'm not even going to repeat them, remarks about the young lads that we were about to play from Six Nations. And in his description, he was also in many ways talking about my, my friend who was sitting beside me on the bench um, in, in the dressing room on my team. And that's probably my first sense of deep difference. Uh, I remember we would sometimes drive my teammate. We'd pick him up and take him to games. And I, I saw something about, um, about his, his home. And, and I, I can't draw a straight line from there to then being in the gardening program and, and meeting Menno Weeb. Um, but somehow there was a spark of, of um, understanding as a child and teenager that, that privilege and, and, and marginalization, not the words I would have used then, or being you know, somehow disenfranchised, um, there was a pretty fundamental break. I don't know when I figured that out, um, but you know, I would say that that opportunity to be in a community in, in Satchigo Lake for a summer, having had some introduction and knowing that I was there, Menno told me, so I believed him, that we were there by invitation, that, that Satchigo Lake wanted me and the young Clausen guy from Gretna to be there that summer. And that meant a lot. And it, you know, I've gone back and read that diary multiple times. And, and um, you know, there, there was at an agency, in that case, MCC, a person in Menno. And so some of the things Steve talked about, about, you know, an open door, a trusted space into which to enter. Uh, I don't know, those would be a, a couple of the things that were early, um, both opportunities and, and probably challenges uh, as a young guy. Thanks for that, Rick. Um, couple stories come to mind and uh, and I hope they're connected, but I can remember Winnipeg used to have this beautiful little spot um, called Nietzsche Commons. It was an indigenous led gathering space, restaurant, bookstore and all this. During, um, it was during I Don't Know More, 2012, 13, there was a gathering there and I rode my bicycle um, up to the North End, parked it. And I remember getting off my bike and just um, 
kind of shaking actually and saying, why am I so nervous? Like I didn't fully understand it. But just to say, I was someone who was already doing this work. Like I'm on the payroll. I'm supposed to know how reconciliation works and all that. And I was nervous going in as a, as a white Christian into a predominantly indigenous space as, a, as that space should be. Um, but just wanting to do it in the right way, not to impose myself and all that. So just to say, um, if you feel nervous, if you feel anxious at times or have fears, you're not alone, you're in good company. Um, and that's part of the process. Second story is um, Leah Gazan, who's now member of parliament for uh, Winnipeg Center. Uh, she's a feisty Lakota woman. Um, check out her House of Commons uh, conversations and debates. Before she was a member of parliament, she was a teacher at the University of Winnipeg and she would invite me to come there uh, each semester to share and uh, to share as a white, um, a white man who's trying to um, pursue indigenous solidarity and be a good relationship and so on. And she invited me to be a white Christian in that space. Leah is not Christian. She's a traditional woman. And she is like totally cool, like uh, with, um, you know, supporting people on a path that is meaningful and joyful uh, for one another, for them. I, she took me aside after a time that I had shared in that class. And she says, Steve, you don't have to be like quiet about your Christianity. She goes, your Jesus, we can get down with him because it's a Jesus of justice. Now she's not saying I'm a Christian, you've, you know, that she's just saying we can respect the kind of Christianity that you're trying to embody, even though you're not wholly there, but you're trying to work it. And so that was deeply empowering for me to have a traditional woman say, take your roots seriously, like I'm taking my roots seriously. Be who you are in that space. Um, that was liberating for, for me to hear that. And through the TRC process, through that you know seven years journey that a lot of us have walked through here where we heard survivors talk about um, the real damage that the church caused in collaboration with the state, uh, it's understandable if we are unsettled about church and Christianity. Um, so it is a messy relationship that we have. But we who are a Christian, I think we have to find ways of saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to try to embody this in an integral way. And it actually doesn't help if I, um, like, I know I'm going to die, Christian. I love, um, I love Jesus, and I love being a part of the church community and so on. Um, and I need to find a good way of holding that relationship in, in these broader relationships. And I think a lot of Indigenous peoples are much more comfortable with uh, religious plurality than some of us Christians do because of the legacies of dominant Christianity, the ongoing legacies. So there's hope there. I, I'm just going to throw in the chat one book that I encourage folks to check out. Brilliant book by uh, a West Coast friend, Denise Nato. It's called Unsettling Spirit. She's a, a Christian woman that worked actually with Project North and Aboriginal Rights Coalition and talks about uh, the ways that she tried to push that Christianity, move it beyond the white savior helper complex which I want to acknowledge, I still struggle that and no doubt in, in some ways embody that. Check. Hey, uh, I know I already spoke to this one, but Steve's prompted one other thing I'd, I'd really like to say. And I remember in early days uh, going to Indigenous communities and being uncertain how to wear my faith, uncertain how to um, speak about being there as an Anabaptist Christian person. And it took a long time to figure out that any attempt to leave that behind or to deny that was actually a further injustice because I need to be part of the owning of the, the savory and the unsavory. It's all part of our legacy. And so for me to, to, to somehow pretend that either I'm not one of them because they did stuff that 
that I would never do, because let's face it, history is going to judge me too. And there's going to be all kinds of stuff that, that people are going to find I fell short on. But I think if I don't claim the same Jesus gospel in whose name many other things have happened, many of them good and many of them very unsavory, then who is claiming it? And, and with whom will there be reconciliation? With, with From whom and with whom will Indigenous communities achieve some sense of justice? So I think it's really critical that we never shrink from or, or pretend we're other than people of the gospel. And that's going to mean some enormous opportunities and some huge challenges. I, I have one last question. Thank you so much for all the wonderful, like there's, this is, yeah, so many um, great things have been said and I'm gonna pull a few of them together for this question. Um, I'm wondering, um, and I'm guessing others are too, what are some of the possibilities that both of you would see today? Steve, you mentioned this idea of creating collaborative zones of courage. And you've said a few times like linking arms makes it much easier to do this stuff that our hearts all flutter when we think about doing some of this work. So what are the possibilities that you see for acting, for creating collaborative zones of courage, especially interfaith uh, collaboration? And Steve, you already mentioned one with EFN and I think that the MCEC Truth and Reconciliation Working Group that I'm a part of needs to learn from what they're doing. So anyway, there's the question for you too. Would love to hear your thoughts on that, both of you. Go ahead, Steve. I'll just quickly say, um, I, I think some of us need to take risks. And, um, you know, we're not going to know wholly who we're uh, linking arms with. That's the process. Like, you get to know people in that journey. And so last year, or a year and a half ago, here's an interesting example. You, when you think of Mennonites, you don't often think of uh, thick relationships with union and labor movements and all that. And we, um, Mennonite Church Canada and uh, churches uh, linked arms with a union out in Alberta and did a treaty walk over a couple of weeks. Um, Scott, if you Google that, you can find a link for one of the videos, treatywalk or treatytalk.com. And that was a, a really wonderful learning experience. It was hard though as well. Like there were a lot of things that we were learning about, about each other and trying to figure out how to walk in a good way together. But that's part of this, this process. You're going to get bruised. Uh, and if you're not doing this work well, you're not like, you will get bruises if you're doing it well. Um, so I think part of it is taking a willingness to take some risks. So I'll finish with this one story that I think it's from, it's Denise Nato's, um, it's a story about Aboriginal Rights Coalition from Denise Nato's book. She talks about, uh, there was a gathering, I think here in Winnipeg with uh, Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en leaders were present with uh, the Rights Coalition. And they were talking about what kind of work do, they, do we need to do together in this alliance? And uh, the Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en were saying, we really actually need you on the front line standing with us in land defense up in Northern BC. And they talked about that and it came down to it. The churches were willing to write petitions. They were willing to talk to politicians, but they weren't willing to go to the front lines. And the story goes, those leaders from uh, Get Sam Wet'suwet'en territory left after that conversation because the churches weren't willing to go where they needed to be. And here's the thing, where they were, indigenous peoples are taking those risks. And the challenge, I think, for churches who are often, uh, we've, we've got to do, as our own gospel says, join with others who are suffering and bear a part of the burden. So that's, I think, the big challenge for us. We can build relationships. It's all possible. It's we'll, whether we're going to bear burdens, willingness to learn and be humble and take a few bruises in the process. But we can do it. And we have done it, although there's been lots of places where we have fallen short or dropped mm -hmm. the ball. Hey, let me also speak about what I would describe as a more entry level space. I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of the blanket exercise. Um, many people here have used it. Some of you, I think, are probably trainers in the Kairos blanket exercise. Um, it doesn't, I, I think there are, if I read, read correctly, there are some online virtual training circles 
now being done because at its best, the blanket exercise, for those of you who are less familiar, is a physical, visceral, um, put some blankets on the floor of the gymnasium and, and actually be walked and talked and physically moved through a couple hundred years of Canadian history. And I don't know of a lot of better um, sort of physical and, and uh, emotional kind of deep learning, especially in early stages to have a, a deeper understanding and deeper appreciation. So church groups, youth groups, um, I, I continue to believe that's a, a really helpful space, entry level. And then there's lots of intermediate steps to the, to the front lines of uh, Brother Steve's comments. Right on. Well, looking at the time, I'm, uh, I'm gonna step in and uh, I'm gonna tell a little story myself and then uh, turn to Stephen Rick and see who would like to give a, a last word and then I'm gonna move into some, some thank yous. I think one thing I've, I've really heard is a call for us to be willing to bring our whole selves into the work. Uh, so our bodies, um, our, uh, our, our beliefs and the things that we love and the things that we consider sacred. And what came to mind for me was a, an encounter I had uh, about eight years ago with a, a theologian called Richard Twiss, who many of you will know. Um, and he was speaking in, uh, in North Carolina. And what he was asking uh, at this sort of um, liberal church conference, let's just call it that. And what he was asking was, is it possible for the Lakota creation story to be held on the same level of sort of canonicity as, as the scriptures? And he sort of asked this question to this group. And the the mostly white, uh, mostly liberal church crowd said, "Oh, oh, don't worry, we don't we don't consider the Bible to be sacred, or something like that." And I mean, it was it's kind of funny, but it also kind of put a hole in that conversation. And when I heard that, I sort of thought, "Oh, you know, am I willing to bring my sacred into this into this conversation? My kind of my truth, things like that." So. Um, Steve and Rick, we always want to give our speakers the chance to have the, the last word. Um, and perhaps I'll just ask you, you know, what is a, what is a gift you'd like to leave with us? Um, what, what is a call or a, um, a gift that you'd like to, to call us to um, as, as we begin our goodbyes? Well, Steve, is it okay if I start again? Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day was uh, earlier this week. And um, one of the pieces I ran across again was his comment, his quote of, um, the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. And yeah, I, I am both less and more patient as I age. And I think that long arc is, is really critical. Um, most change that lasts isn't immediate and overnight. And please don't hear this as excusing a, um, you know, a, a turtle-like pace on these things. Uh, on the other hand, I think, I, I do believe that some of what we've seen, for instance, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was societal changing. Uh, I mean, it's gonna take energy to stay there, but I, I think something deeper has been happening both in our churches and the broader community. So let's continue to take the long view. Um, you don't, don't, don't check your faith at the door, make that the place in which this work is grounded. This is gospel reconciliation work and anything less is not gonna take us on the long arc, but it does bend toward justice. Yeah, may it be. Um, circling back to the, one of the earlier questions, this is what I'd like to leave. Um, I think it was talking about, uh, both in reflecting about Menno, but in what are the, some of the first steps that we can take to engage this conversation? I really, 
I think I learned through the TRC process something about the role of elders. Mm -hmm. It was modeled so deeply um, the importance of the knowledge keepers, the older ones in our midst that hold stories and have really deep roots to care for us middle, middle ones and the younger ones uh, as we try to find um, our vocation, our calling, our gift to offer the circle. Like they, they are foundations. <laughs> They're not afterthought. And I, I think that's a challenge for a lot of us to recover in, our, in some of our church circles and our community circles. But how do we honor the elders? And how do we hear the stories and remember those stories so that we can live well in the present? When I first moved to Winnipeg, I actually... Um, that's something I was intentional about doing. Through, uh, through some friends here, I actually sat down and had breakfast a couple of times with Menno Weeb and heard some of those stories. It was really important for me to say, I can, I can have integrity in this work that I'm doing if I honor those who came before. And I think there's something about that when in the Haldeman tract or other parts of Ontario, or if you're um, in different spaces and places, uh, who are those elders and knowledge keepers that you can get to know, to honor their stories, to gift, and to receive uh, receive their gifts. Both uh, the Mennonite elders, the Indigenous elders of those spaces. I think hearing those stories, stories are, uh, it's like the Thomas King thing. I'm not getting it right, but it's like, um, the most, they're the most powerful medicine that we have. If we hold on to those, uh, we're going to be... Um, doing some pretty marvelous things together. Mm. Oh, thinking of stories and elders. One of my favorite elders is, uh, I hope he's not listening because maybe he doesn't go by that, but Adrian Jacobs, who's a little bit older than me. He lives, uh, he's Cayuga and from uh, Six Nations. Currently he's living out in Beauceshire, Manitoba, but he's gonna be our next presenter teacher uh, in February. And Adrian's brilliant. And prophetic, uh, and he'll yeah. lovingly unsettle us in uh, deep, deep, respectful conversation. So I encourage you to join us for that. Thanks so much for that invitation. Hope to see you all then. Um, thank you so much, Rick and Steve. I've been watching many people uh, respond with gratitude throughout um, for for your willingness to step up and share some of what you've learned. And um, I just want to add my thanks to that as well. Um, thanks as well to uh, Scott, who's done chat moderation, uh, to uh, Lisa, who's been doing the, the tech stuff. Um, and thanks to Mim for holding us all together in prayer. And um, I'm just very, very happy to turn it over to you to close this in, in a good way. Thank you. Whoops, there we go. All right. Um, so a lot of things have come to mind and I have been sitting here in prayer the whole time, which is what I do um, when the speaker part is going on. Um, one thing I think we all need to do, no matter where we are on our journey, is take down the mirror and then break the wall that is hanging on and see what's beyond that. Um, we're not going to move forward until we do that. And I, I strongly encourage you to do that. You are going to make mistakes, but you do in life anyway. So that's okay. People will also forgive you, um, for what you unknowingly do, especially if you realize that you've done something without meaning to harm there was a saying that kept coming back to me. Some people put um, about Colton Bushi in the chat and Dudley George and the missing and murdered women, children and the men, um, the Oka. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure who said it first or where it came from, but I know it's been around for a little while is they thought they could kill us, but they didn't realize that we were the seed. And that has stuck with me for many years, for quite a while now. Um, whenever I start getting discouraged or um, 
forgetting to live in hope. Um, a friend of mine actually today is the anniversary of his death a year ago, Father Norm Casey. Um, we committed to each other that we would try our hardest to live in hope, even when it didn't look like there was hope. Um, so I encourage you to do that as well. I don't usually prepare anything or have anything in mind before I open or close. Um, but when I was thinking about tonight and thinking about Rick and Steve um, speaking, I was going through, I have a folder on my computer of interesting sayings and stories. And as I was scrolling through, this one popped up and I forgot it was there, to be honest with you. And I hadn't read it for a very long time. And it just really hit. It just hit. It just felt like it was. So I sent it to Steve and I said, what do you think? And so we had a little pre-meeting. I read it to the group and I said, but we'll see. If I don't feel like it's right at the end, we're not going to use it. But it is like fitting right in with what has been talked about tonight. So Peter is going to help me do this. He is going to read the human and I am going to read the creator part. And as we're going through this, I want you to think of the church, the church as a whole, your church, your whatever your tradition is. But I also want you to think of yourself and think of yourself um, within the context of what we're going to read. So Peter. Hello. Hello, creator. Hello. I'm falling apart. Can you put me back together? Mm, I'd rather not. Why? Because you're not a puzzle. What about all the pieces of my life that fall to the ground? Leave them there for a while. They fell for a reason. Let them be there for a while and then decide if you need to get any of those pieces back. You don't understand. I'm breaking up. No, you don't understand. You're transcending. You're evolving. What you feel are growing pains. You're getting rid of the things and the people in your life that are holding you back. The pieces are not falling down. The pieces are put, being put into place. Relax, take a deep breath and let those things go that you no longer, sorry, take a deep breath and let those things you no longer need fall down. Stop clinging to pieces that are no longer for you. Let them fall, let them go. Once I start doing that, what will I have left? Only the best pieces of yours. I'm afraid to change. I keep telling you, you're not changing. You're becoming. Becoming? Becoming who? Becoming who I created you to be. A person of light, love, charity, hope, courage, joy, mercy, grace, and compassion. I made you for so much more than those shallow pieces you decided to, do, to adorn yourself with and that you cling to with so much greed and fear. Let those things fall off you. I love you. Don't change. Become. Don't change. Become. Become who I want you to be, who I created. I'm going to keep telling you this until you remember. Oh, there goes another piece. Yes. Let it be like this. So I'm not broken? No, but you're breaking the darkness like dawn. It's a new day. Become. Become who you really are. And unfortunately, I don't know the author, 
of that. Um, but I think it speaks. A friend of mine uses the, the saying, we're not humans, be human beings. We are humans being. So I leave that with you tonight. Walk well, walk strong, walk in kindness. And when you go out tomorrow, look around you and realize you're not alone, that there are many things around you that are helping to sustain you, but that are also walking with you. The winds, the four legged the sun that's gonna come up in the morning, they're all our relations and they all need our love and our attention. So take what you've heard tonight, take it to your heart, do what you need to do with it. And let's try to make this world a much better place than it is today. Miigwech, yo. Thank you. And go in peace. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I have no more wise words, just gratitude. Wonderful to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Good night. Good night.